we must be the regeneration. Everything in this universe is made up of tiny inanimate particles, leptons, hadrons, electrons, neutrons, atoms, yet as far as we know, it is only in this tiny little planet within a thin 10 mile wide strip called the biosphere that the miracle of life takes place. It's where these inanimate particles are transformed by photosynthesis into water and what we are, species. And we share this planet in this remarkable place with millions of species. This is a wonder of nature and it is the wonder of Earth. We are very lucky. Yet today our miraculous home is deeply threatened by how we behave, how we consume, how we develop. We have changed the chemistry of the planet Earth, threatening all life, all people. Species extinctions are a thousand times greater than natural rates. 20 minutes it takes Every 20 minutes, a species goes extinct. 90% of the fish that we depend upon are endangered. We've had the hottest six months, year, and decade in a thousand years with record temperatures. In Pakistan, temperatures higher than ever recorded with 20 million people displaced. In Russia, fires burn for weeks, resulting in wheat prices doubling. Greenland, Central Europe, Nigeria, China. In Los Angeles, two weeks ago, the national thermometer exploded when temperatures reached 113 degrees Fahrenheit. Welcome to summer's new norm. Add to this the pressure of population, 6.9 billion and growing. In 40 years, we'll be at 9.2 billion people. That's 2 billion more people entering the middle class, which is twice the entire number of middle class people that have ever existed in all the history of humanity. And to cover this doubling of demand, we're going to have to double energy output, water output, and food output, all on a planet whose ecological foundation is threatened and stressed. So Dr. Jared Diamond, who wrote Collapse, and Ed Wilson have said, we can do this if we have two more planet Earths. So, is all hopeless? Well, no. There are definitely signs of progress. And I believe we are entering kind of the age of the true green economy, or as Tom Friedman talks about it, the age of regeneration. We're beginning to see signs of a willingness to build economies that rebuild and restore the healthy ecosystems that are the foundation for all life, that are the foundations for our climate stability, our water security, our health security, our food security, our protection from natural disasters. So I'm very hopeful. But we have to make a fundamental change in the most powerful force on Earth, and that's the force of development. We're going to have to put within development the grail of conservation. Simply stated, humanity has to begin to understand that we need nature to thrive. Nature does not need us. Our development of renewable fuels must be part of a larger strategy that regenerates the fragile ecosystems and the biodiversity that we all depend upon. I'd like to describe three partnerships that are emerging that have huge transformative impacts and will allow us to get to the scale that we have to achieve. The first focuses on food security. This is a partnership with the largest foundation in the world, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The foundation has focused on how do you improve the quality of life of farming families in Africa. And they focus on seeds, access to market, and new farming technologies. So why would they partner with a conservation organization? Because for farms to be productive for the long haul, they need healthy ecosystems for sustained inputs of pollinators, of water, of mycorrhizae, and soils. The Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, led by Kofi Annan, has joined this partnership to ensure that agriculture and conservation can go hand in hand in the sub-Saharan nations. What we're trying to put together is an open source global monitoring network that will look at the linkages and the trade-offs between livelihood and poverty, ecosystem health, species health, 
and climate change, siloed information that has to be understood collaboratively to avoid trade-offs. For example, where will water come from when the forests of the Congo Basin are cleared? What is going to be the impact on food production, economies, and people? The second partnership that is very important is a partnership with commerce and the world's largest retailer, Walmart. Four years ago, we began an effort to get Walmart to go green because they have the power to transform entire industries. Today, Walmart is creating a sustainability index for every single product it sells. Their goal is to drive sustainability principles into their massive global supply chain. Over 100,000 suppliers and all of their suppliers are reducing waste, increasing water efficiency, reducing energy use, adopting farming and fishing certification standards so that they can get priority shelf space in Walmart. Why? Because businesses make more money when they operate sustainably. And they attract consumers, they empower their employees, they reduce waste, and they secure their supply chain. The third partnership is with leaders of nations. Nations like Brazil and Colombia, Rwanda, Cambodia, Indonesia, on how to accurately value the contributions that ecosystems and biodiversity make to their societies. And also the cost to a nation when they lose their forests and their glaciers that provide water, or their coral reefs that provide their fish, or their mangroves that protect them from storm. The value of these services, which is hard to quantify, has been estimated to be $44 trillion per year. So the environmental factors, when they're not contained in an economy, are undervalued. But if they are considered in assessing a state's creditworthiness or financial health, you begin to make financial accounting systems that value nature part of the economy, creating financial incentives for taking care of species and ecosystems. Three years ago, the Minister of Natural Resources of Costa Rica came up with a business plan to reforest and to protect forests in Costa Rica. What he did was he said, we're going to begin to look at forests as water factories. And what we're going to do is ask downstream users to compensate upstream landowners for taking care of their landscapes in a smart way. That Minister of Natural Resources is now working with the government of Sichuan province in China to do the same thing. Because Sichuan is the headwaters of the Yangtze River. And the Yangtze River is a source of fresh water for the largest city on earth, Shanghai. Building true economies is the challenge we face. But countries like Madagascar, Colombia, Ecuador are beginning to come up with new approaches and new systems. These are all reasons for great hope. They're demonstrations that we actually can come up with answers. Historians refer to a moment like we ex experience today as an open moment. This is a time when societies come together and there's real change possibilities. Never before have more students, more institutions, more businesses, more communities, more nations come together to find answers to the most fundamental challenge of this century, which is how do we create a sustainable future? By harnessing our genius, your genius, by harnessing nature, we can actually make this the regeneration. That's the challenge that we have to rise to. Thank you.